so today we'll start a new exercise on uh, glacier lake outboard flood as you have already seen that lot of uh, disasters are recurrent in india so we must be learning about what are the reasons what are the origination how did it originated and uh, what are the consequences and the mitigation measures that we have to take uh, for the management and mitigation of uh, this bluff glacier lake outburst flood that is one of the most uh, upcoming resource topic that uh, majority of the researchers throughout the world are looking into so you can see on the right hand side that a uh, few satellite images had been showing the various parts of bluff so you can see that uh, there are lakes that have been found in this mountainous terrain and adjoining to it uh, you are seeing that some uh, bluish uh, uh, spectral response tonal variation is there so that is the indicative that in and around that uh, uh, terrain there is some glaciers and uh, pertaining to that glaciers this uh, glacier lakes have been formed so now we'll be seeing how to identify this how to monitor it how to map it how to evaluate it and finally we'll be providing some mitigation and measurements about this uh, glacier lake outboard fault so my uh, today topic of uh, presentation will comprise of what is a lake then origin of lakes what you heard how these lakes are different from glacier lakes morants and structures moran dominated lakes why this work is required how does it uh, significance for the international community then mapping of glaciers and moran dam lakes how this uh, morans and uh, lakes are developed then bathymetric analysis because in order to know the depth uh, the bathymetric analysis is necessary so we'll be doing how the bathymetric analysis is being performed then remote sensing based uh, measurements how the remote sensing and gis techniques help us used to identify the glacial lake outburst flow then various kinds of algorithms that we are using your familiar with but i uh, will be seeing how it will be uh, with a specific to glacial lake outburst flow then lake volume and peak discharge estimation to what can be the maximum volume if there is a maximum amount of rainfall that is expected in any area <coughs> and finally what is the probability of that glade to be outburst because until unless it is not outburst it is a glade so it gets a name only if there is a outburst so we'll be going it so what is a lake all together so a lake is a large body of water within a body of land so that we already have seen we have know that uh, that is a large body as a lake is separated from ocean it is not a sea as it is not connected to ocean uh, uh it's not a part of a sea that's why we reclassify it as a lake some lakes are very big some can be small that can be of different in size and the people in the past time calls them seas um, in the ancestral time they many times they have been calling as that as a seas lake do not flow the biggest uh, if you want to differentiate between a river and the reservoir and the lake is there you won't find any flowing of a river like rivers but many have rivers flowing into and out of them so just like guru gobind sagar lake that is in bilaspur draining the waters into punjab haryana so that is a lake that has been constructed on the river satluj so if you go around you will be seeing that the water is stagnant so many times it may be a part of a river many times it may be discharged or disconnected with a river so don't get confused so most of the lakes on the surface of the world are fresh water we are also using uh, this uh, guru govind lake water for irrigation in rajasthan haryana punjab so their first water uh, fresh water and most are in northern hemisphere as we are located more than 60% of the lake of the world are in canada canada has a large amount of lake and so is in india finland is also known as a lake of thousand lakes just like uh, if you go in 
Rajasthan, Udaipur is called as city of lakes. So we do in India has got a large number of lakes. So many lakes are natural, many lakes are man-made, like Guru Gobind Sagar Lake in Bilaspur already stated. That is a main made and that is a reservoir built to produce the electricity. It can be also used because you not only are creating electricity, but you are also using for irrigation purpose or you are also using the water for irrigation, industry and houses. So whenever a, a lake or as a reservoir, many times it is constructed, it is used for multi purposes that we have already stated. So if there are not rivers flowing out of lake or they are few and small, the lake leases water only by the evaporation or because the waters flow through the soil courses. So when you see that the, there is a lake and it is not connected to any a big river or river is not flowing through it, the water gradually reduces and that reducing nature is because of the infiltration process that uh, it goes through the porosity and permeability of the soil and as well as you will be getting through evapor transpiration. So when the water evaporates rapidly and the soil around the lake has a high salt content as in very dry places the water of the lake has a high concentration of salt and the lake is called as a salt lake. So summer lake. So as we are from Rajasthan so many of the persons and the students are from Rajasthan so they are familiar about this summer lake. So this is how that lake has been created as well as you go to the various parts in Gujarat, you will be finding such kinds of salt lake very prominent in Gujarat. So natural lakes are generally found in mountainous areas. So if you go into the mountains or in the rift zones or the area with the ongoing glaciation. So all the temporary, all the lakes are temporary over the geological time scale as they will slowly fill in with the sediments or spill out of the cons basin containing them. So if you go with the major problem in the reservoirs or the lakes through the world because they are getting the water from there is some external agency or the agent that provides the water to that lake and that external agent do provide sediments so over the uh, period of time the amount of sedimentation is very high so that's why the volume of that lake gradually decreases and the volume or the pressure of the wall gradually increases that's why you will see that nowadays there is a lot of uh, uh, case of uh, man-made disasters. So, on definition of a lake is a body of water with two hectares or more in the area. So, whenever you will get any lake with a area size more than two hectares or five hectares that is classified as lake. The smallest unit, uh, if you go, then you will go, go with a lake, then you will be going with a pond, thereafter a tank tank after swimming pools and that is the smallest unit. So how this uh, lakes originated? So we'll be going for the origination of those lakes. So uh, various scientists have presented a comprehensive analysis of the origination of the lake, how did it uh, happen, what is the classification. So this classification recognizes uh, by various scientists into 11 major types of lakes. They have got various kinds of lakes. Where it's a very new term for many of you because generally you call any lake a lake. But yeah, now after reading this uh, presentation, now you have to uh, declassify those lakes into various terminologies that like lakes are, those 11 lakes are tectonic lakes. The lakes that are found or created in tectonic plates then you have got volcanic lakes, the lakes that are created along the volcanoes, the lakes created from landslides, then glacial lakes, solution lakes, fluvial lakes, shoreline lakes along the coast, organic lakes, anthropogenic lakes and metrolite lakes. So you can see that uh, majority are related to the geological activity that uh, we have done, either it is a natural or that is a man-made. Now we will be more focused to the current topic that today we are studying that is a glacial lake. What is a glacial lake? So glacial lakes are lakes created by the direct action of the glaciers and the continent ice. So whenever as we are saying glacial lake. So wherever a lake is associated with a glacier and the ice sheets that are 
classified under glacial lakes. A wide variety of glacial processes create enclosing basins. As a result, there is a wide variety of different types of glacial lakes, and it's often it's difficult to define the clear cut distinction between different types of glacial lakes and lakes influenced by other activities. The general types of glacial lakes that has been recognized in direct contact with ice, glacial craft, rock basin and depression, moranic and outworks lake, glacial drift basins. So glacial lakes are numerous lakes in the world. Most of the lakes in the northern Europe or northern America has either influenced or created by latest development but not because of glaciation to have covered the origin. The glacial lakes include the common lakes that we are talking about is pro-glacial lakes, sub-glacial lakes and apicelf lakes. Apicelf lakes are highly stratified lakes in which lakes of fresh water derived from ice and snow melt is dammed behind a ice sheet that is attached to a coastline and they are mostly found in Antarctica. That is not uh, common in our area. Now we will see that how these lakes are created. To understand the formation of a glacial lake, it is required to first understand about the movement of glaciers and morans that are created. When the slope, weight and under conditions are sufficient to overcome the friction, the ice begins to slide by the mountain slope. So the, you will be seeing slide of the mountain slope. And that is also known as moving glacier. The moving or the glacier ice shield act as a natural bulldozer and conveyor belt and carries all those loose materials into its path. So it will carry all those loose material that is beneath it with the glacier mass. And this material eroded by the glacier is dropped at the edges, both at the terminal and the lateral. So, thus, a moral includes clay, silt, sand, and coarse sediment of various dimensions like gravels, large boulders, coarse sand, rocks, etc. In many cases, sediment is highly compacted with high mechanical resistance. These morans act as a natural drain across the narrow mountain valleys. Growth of water volume in the lakes, retreat of the glacier terminus, slope of the glacier, wheat moraine layer, moraine erosion, potential peeping, seepage, the presence of hanging glaciers that call or that falls into the lake, landslide and earthworm increases the risk. So you can see that uh, this is a diagram that we have created. So you can see that what is the current day of glacial surface and there is a on surface glacier toe attached to it. So what will happen? There will be a slight movement because of the gravitational pressure. It will move downwards. So when it will be moved downwards, you'll be seeing that these are the debris that are covered already by different kinds of sand and silt and various earth materials. So what will happen? This material will gradually uh, reduce and will convert itself into water. So that water will be in the form of lake and that lake over the period of time will be beyond the carrying capacity or beyond the holding capacity of this section B. At one point of a time, if it is beyond the carrying capacity or the holding capacity of B, this entire will under the pressure of gravitational pressure will move downwards and that will create an undue uh, amount of water receiving in any particular period of time that can be during rainy season that can be beyond the raiding season that can be because of high increase in temperature there is a lot of uh, melting process going on and that leads to enormous mass of uh, water in any area that is stuck up with the moraines and gradually with the pressure created it flow downwards and that can create a havoc in the low-lying areas. So moraine dam lake. So what a lake we are talking about or what I was talking about. A glacier lake is defined as a water mass existing in the sufficient amount and extending with the free surface in 
under, beside, and or in front of a glacier and originated by glacier activities. As per the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development Report of 2011, the glacial lakes are broadly classified as moraine dam lakes. The melted water is held by moraine which act as a natural dam that I have already stated that you can see there are moraines filled with sand, glaciers, gravel and that act as a barrier for storing this melt water or the movement of the glacier that has happened because of the gravitational pressure, the pressure is high. So the water melted from the glaciers get accumulated in between the snout and the end bone. So what does it uh, done? It is the water between the snout and between the end of the moraine and such lakes are termed as moraine dam lakes. Some lakes are accumulated between the lateral moraine and the valley side along the glacial margin. These lakes have high tendency of bursting as a dam and are physically weak and unstable and undergo various changes due to slope pressure, slumping, etc. So you can see that uh, uh, how this uh, area like uh, you can see this is a glacier water and this is the moraine area. There was uh, you can see this is accumulation zone. And this is the glacier limbs. This is ablation. Then you have got a lateral moraine. Then you have got a snout. So these are the uh, few terms when you are uh, talking about glacial lake outwards first you must be familiar with. So glacier tape can be classified as moraine dam lake. It can also be uh, reclassified as uh, ice dam lake, then erosion lakes and other lakes and finally ice dam lakes can be further subdivided into supra glacier lakes and glacier dam lakes. So why this work is rated, why it's important to read because you have seen that recent Kedarnath incident or the incident that took, point, uh, took place in Uttarakhand that was all because of glacial lake outward flush. So burst or sudden discharge of a large volume of water along with the debris from these slugs causes glacial lake outward flush in the valley downstream causing managed damage to the infrastructure like dams, roads, residential area, farms, natural resources like forest, fauna, human life, all are destroyed. So I'll be not going into the much detail because we have seen recently the Kedarnath flood, the Uttarakhand flood. We have seen how devastating it was, how the large amount of sediment it carried with it and how it uh, disrupted and a lot of people lost their life, a lot of uh, there were damage to the forest, hydropower was washed out. So there is a strong need to monitor this uh, lakes of formation, expansion and uh, uh, vulnerability. Many Himalayan basins report fastly growing uh, glaciers, uh, greatly increasing the threat of glacial lake outburst flood. So because of the change in the climatic conditions, we have got a large area under the glacier. So we are uh, facing the biggest problem of uh, glacial lake outburst flood in the uh, coming future. So glacial lake outbursting, these banks can have a catastrophic con uh, consequences for people, agriculture, hydropower, infrastructure downstream that uh, we have already seen through the various uh, news channels, YouTube channels have shown how devastating those floods were and we were the witness, the country was the witness. So glacial uh, lake outburst flood occur when the water is stored behind, under or within the glaciers is uh, released rapidly. So that is what we have seen. So the recent flood in the Kedanmat, the most notable event in the Indian history. This event occurred on the early morning of 17 June 2013 in which overlay and collapse of uh, Korabari MDL after overflow and collapse of Moraine Dam Korabari Lake, which released large amount of water that caused flash flood in Kedarnath and the downstream area. So this is the area that we are talking about. This is the water that created a disaster in the low lying areas and post uh, disaster, you can see that how this area is totally freezed with snow, debris and other materials. So the mapping of glaciers and moraine damp levels 
so field measurement if you see it's very tough to go into the field and measure those dams generally those areas are inaccessible so uh, the orthodox way of method that we used to do was plain table uh, survey or a theodolite survey then you have got a plain table survey is a geographical or a graphical method of survey in which the field observation and plotting are done simultaneously it is a simple and cheaper than theodolite survey and is more suitable for small scale maps but with the increase in the technology with the increase of the instrumentation this all process have been uh removed or updated with the satellite remote sensing and instrumentation then you got a theodolite survey that the early edm instruments could measure the long distance with the accuracy of five parts per million but later version were more accurate and able to accur uh, accuracy about one part per mil per million that is one millimeter per kilometer or 30 millimeter over 30 kilometers line so these days, uh, they are also many types of accurate and compact EDM instruments integrated with an electronic theodolite and known as total station. So now this uh, theodolite has been replaced with a total station where the accuracy of the map has increased uh, drastically. So now, as we have already uh, done various exercises related to your DGPS survey related to theodolite survey. So I'll be not going much into the detail about the basics of the theodolite as well as the total station. The next term that comes to your study is bathymetry survey. So what is the bathymetry study says about? It is the study of the beds or the floats of the water body. So what we uh, do study, we study the beds or the floats including the oceans, rivers, streams, and the lakes. Sonars, we are already using it in some areas. That is sound navigation and raising using sound waves to find and identify objects in the water and determine the water depth. So whatever some marines that we are using, how would they know where they are stand because they are flowing beneath the water. So at that point of time, to in order to locate the various odd uh, elements that are situated or that are created beneath the water, we use a sonar waves. So side scan sonar is a specialized sonar system for searching and detecting the objects on the sea floor. Like sonar, a side scan transmits sound energy and analyzes the return signal echo <coughs> that has bound off the sea floor or from the other object. So you can see this is an instrument that has created a vibration and on the basis of its distance this again the backscattered and is recorded that is the same principle that we have already studied in radar the here instead of radio waves we are using sound waves for your area of investigation and the backscattered energy is being recorded the strength of the return echo is continuously recorded, creating a picture of the ocean bottom for example objects that protrude from the bottom create a light area strong return and the shadows from this object are dark that is little or no return so now we'll be talking about remote sensing and gis because we were waiting here how our subject our remote sensing and gis the satellite image will come into uh, its role so the, there are two ways either you can go for the digital image classification or you can go for the visual interpretation for the visual interpretation you need to procure the satellite data thereafter you will be georeferencing the satellite data thereafter you will be delineating the late extent the moran dams land can be observed with a typical black or blue in nature as we already know that the water bodies of various uh, seen as a color of blue and black in a standard false color composite and then we will be classifying on the basis of the various digital image processing technique. So here you can see that we have taken a 2014 satellite images and in the first image you can see from 1989 to 1996 uh, uh, from 1965 to 1976 1976 to 1985 or 89 what is the difference so you can see a lot of a difference in the seep has been there in the lake so not only that we'll be using the various satellite data that is advanced wide field scanner from the resource at one where we'll be using the different bands to identify this uh, water bodies glacier area so 
uh, we know that uh, the snow is seen as a white in color in the standard or uh, panchromatic images so that shows in a bright white color so you can see that is a uh, snow in between you can see some dark objects with a uh, shadow in beneath it so that is a cloud so you can see now you can differentiate with a uh, uh, how you will be differentiating between a cloud and a uh, snow in a uh, panchromatic image of uh, band 2 with a uh, a spectral resolution of 0.4, 0.52 to 0.59 micrometers then band 3 that is uh, 0.62 to 0.68 that is a red band uh, again you can uh, identify the non glaciers or the non snow then snow then clouds the same is the band 4 with 0.7 to 0.86 so you can see that how in different uh, bands the different kinds of cloud cover the different kinds of snow the non snow area can be easily differentiated so using the spectral response curve if you are creating a scatter plotter of a waves data acquired on the december 17 2013 you can see how there is a difference between the water then snow under shadow then snow then cloud cover vegetation so all each and every features can be easily discriminated so enhancement of open water and wetland vegetations that we are doing so there are various methods for extracting the water from remote sensing imagery that we have already studied in our digital image processing which is according to the number of bands that we have used either can be, be a single band or a multi band in single band generally we are using a, a multi spectral to discriminate the water from the subjective threshold values like ndwi ndvi ndbi and DPI and DTI. So these are the various uh, techniques and DSI we also use for uh, identification of different kinds of snow while multiband methods takes advantage of reflective differences of each involved band. So you can see that uh, the uh, bands, the multispectral because of the color combination, they provide the better ability to differentiate between the various earth objects when you compare with the panchromatic image that is a black and white image so the general uh, indices that we use for discrimination of this lake, uh, glacier lake outburst work in NDWI that is green minus near infrared by green plus near infrared that is called as uh, normalized difference water index NDWI given by Mac Fitter in 1996 published in International Journal of Remote Sensing volume 7 1996 from page number 1425 to 1432 which states the band combination chooses were green and near infrared what was the purpose of selection this band was uh, to maximize the typical reflectance of water bodies by using the green light wavelength so if you see the spectral response curve the maximum reflectance of a water in a green uh, light and medium um, a low reflectance of nir by low water in near infrared features so maximum in green band, minimum in NIR band. And we wanted to use the both the, the maximum feature and the minimum feature and take the advantage of high reflectance of NIR by terrestrial vegetation and the soil feature. So if you are taking a near infrared band into consideration there, because the water contains is zero, you can easily identify between the vegetation and the soil. So the open water futures will have a positive value. So the water will have a positive value and the terrestrial soil and vegetation will have a zero or a negative value. So the range varies from zero to one due to normalization. The other uh, indices that we use is mod uh, modified normalized water index that is MNDWI that is uh, given by ZOO in 2006 again published in International Journal of Remote Sensing in 2006 which states that the reflectance pattern of build-up land in green and NIR is similar to that of a water. So what does it say is that, that uh, NDWI that we created in 1996, many times the build-up area and the uh, difference between the build-up and the water was quite less as they were giving the same reflectance in the near infrared band. So the average reflectance of the build-up land in MIR is greater than that if uh, green. Therefore, MIR band is used instead of NIR in the NDVI where the build-up land shows a negative value. So, we use um, uh, middle infrared instead of uh, this uh, NIR band because there the differentiation between the 
water and uh, the build up area was easily noticeable and based on the assumption our amenity is given by mnda vi that is called as green minus uh, mir by green plus mir again we already know that uh, what do you mean by ndvi that is the index that uh, has been given by uh, scientist uh, townshend and justice in 19x86 uh, and tucker and seller in 1986 again in international journal of remote sensing in 1986 where the index takes an advantage of the condition where the presence of features like higher nir reflectance and lower red reflectance terrestrial will be enhanced while those with a low red reflectance and very low nir reflectance of water will be suppressed or even eliminated that's why the ndvi is nir minus red by nir plus red so the vegetated surface tend to see a positive value base salts have a zero and open water has a negative value and the ranges from uh, minus 1 to plus 1 then you have got a normalized pond index uh, that we are using that is the classes ndvi will not perform well for the vegetation within the wetlands so the behavior of the vegetation inside and outside of the wetlands cannot be distinguished therefore uh, the latter can be used for detecting the vegetation within the ponds and the reflectance of water is higher in green when it's compared to the vegetation in mir band therefore a new index has been generated that is ndpi that suggests mir minus green by mir plus green then again you have got a new indices that is a normalized difference turbidity index given by lockhart in 2007 which says that the pure water has a specific radiometric response its reflectance is weak in green less than 10% and becomes very small in red and uh null in near infrared the increase in the turbidity and associated radiometric response makes the open water ponds behave like a bright soil according to grode in 1989 since the values of the rate radiometric refraction or the responses are much larger than the that of the green ones the relationship between the green and the red wavelengths is reversed as per campbell 1996 which suggests ndty equals to red minus green by red plus green so this is the model as you are already familiar of creating the various model in adas imaging software so you will be making the various kinds of ndwi mndwi ndpi ndpi and ndti and all will be taken into consideration for demarcation of this uh, glacial lake outburst fault so what you will be taking will be georeferencing the satellite data using the first or second polynomial order then we'll be subsetting it according to our area of interest whether we want to go for a basin level or a catchment level or water level watershed level then we'll be putting the various kinds of models will be uh, creating ndwi the different indices that we have already studied and on the basis of of that will be providing the threshold value on the basis of those threshold values will be segmenting or differentiating the various earth objects like uh, vegetation snow water and finally will be classifying our uh, lake so the algorithm that we are using is normalized difference water index we have already defined that the green minus uh, nir by green plus uh, nir and then mndwi that is green minus swr by green plus swr and uh, the water in ndwi is uh, in terms of uh, its standard false color composite it will be greater than 0.03 and for mndwi or ndsi that will normalize difference snow index it will be greater than or equal to 0.4 in water so what we'll do we want to see the uh, lake volume and the peak discharge estimation that is equally important so for getting the maximum water depth of a uh, lake the akaikai sai equations is used for calculation the maximum depth of the uh, water where the cross section across the valley are formed using the as the ddm that is a distal elevation model with a spatial resolution of 30 meter which was exploited over the lake to estimate the approximate depth of uh, mdl 
then depth determined using both the methods were found to be approximately C. Then empirical relationship developed by Sakai between the area and the volume of glacial lakes in Nepal and Bhutan Himalayan region has been used in the present study where the volume uh, C is the volution of volume of the lake and A is the surface of the lake in kilometers. So on the basis of that, uh, the different scientists have given the different uh, definition, the different formulas for calculation of the volume. And on the basis of that, we can calculate the total amount of volume in any particular area. And then we can compare with the area, with the depth, what is the depth, what is the volume, and what is the amount of error induced on those calculations, what is the amount of total depth error that is produced and on the peak discharge what can be the maximum volume that can be expected from that uh, glacial lake can be calculated using this formula and the equation where we calculate about the peak discharge and the volume and lastly we'll be going for the probability of the outburst what is the probability of the outburst of that lake so we'll be using the current formula where we'll be using the area, the model parameters for using the formula is area, where the area has a positive regression coefficient, then outburst probability increases with the increasing lake area. This is directly proportional. If the area is more, the amount of danger is more. If the area is less, the volume is less, the danger is less. So ice code or ice free Himalayan region have ice free moraine dam lakes. Then Moran dam height to the depth ratio, what is the height and what is the depth of the water. This is because the water flow in narrower, narrow Moran dam needs erode only a small amount of sediment Moran height to width is estimated by satellite images and digital elevation model. For this purpose, Google Earth images is used. And finally, we'll be uh, mapping and seeing the various kinds of uh, rock types available in that area. So on the basis of that uh, model, we'll be getting a table which suggests the regression uh, uh, coefficient value for the outburst probability. Okay, what is the total probability of that outburst? Then what is the category? And finally, the coefficient value. So there we'll be getting the intercept, then more modern height and width, then ice core, ice core, lake area, geological uh, investigation, because uh, you have to see that uh, what kind of uh, rock types are available in that area because uh, the strength of the material lies on the strength of the rock types present in that area. If we compare with uh, three different kinds of rock types, if you go, the weakest will be sedimentary, sedimentary rock types. So you have to identify the materials, whether that is of a metamorphic origin or a sedimentary origin or a igneous origin. Thereafter, we'll be mapping the various kinds of lake area. It can be square uh, kilometers in square hectares. Then we'll be measuring the height versus width. Thereafter, we'll be uh, measuring the probability of occurrence of that uh, disaster. So on the basis of this, you can see that how these glacial lakes are outburst are uh, created and how this has to be used and mapped in the real sense so that we can have a real understanding of that area. So for, this is all that uh, we have today for the glacial lake outburst. So at the end of the day, we are very confident enough that how the remote sensing and GIS technique is helped to monitor the different kinds of uh, snort, accumulation zone, ablation zone, and then what is the total amount of area and depth of the secondary data like distal elevation model of uh, SRTM or uh, Aster GDM will be used for creation of the profile. Then how the multi-temporal data sets will be taken to estimate the spatial temporal dynamics that we have created or we have generated for identification of this glove. Thereafter, we'll be using the various kinds of indexes like uh, we have already stated that what are the indices like NDWI, then we have got the NDPI, then NDTI, NDVI, 
so these are the various kinds of indexes that you have to uh, generate prior to going for a final classification because you have to map the exact extent of the volume of water and you have to differentiate between the various earth categories and then we can artificially create a condition and we can highlight the different uh, zones uh, according to its severity that if you have got a uh, for example if i have got a 10 lakes created in any particular area i can classify that according to the various parameters models that we have already studied in which area has got the higher probability of getting a glove and what can be the expected date of origin because you have to the key to success is early morning system so the satellite data provides you the information provides you the uh, definition provides you the technique through which you can easily map you can easily delineate you can easily monitor you can easily see the multi temporal dynamics what are the changes that has happened what is the health of that water whether that is into the aggradation side or whether that is into the degradation side and what is the total amount of volume that has been accumulated over the period of time what is the whether that is a local in nature or whether that is regional in nature whether that is because of the glacial melt or that is because of the glacial movement so all such parameters all such functions all such analysis because the terrain what we are trying to study is inaccessible you cannot go to many of the part of the area what we are trying to do so if you want to save the society if you want to save the humanity if you want to save your hydro power projects if you want to save your flora fauna in any area and you want to give a happy life to the people who are living in the low lying areas feeling that they are safe but they don't know ki what can be the future disaster that is hitting to that area or that can happen in the near future that recently we have noticed in uttarakhand or the kedarnath flood that can happen at any point of time at any day at any time and for that the uh, analysis the mapping the monitoring of such uh, uh, lakes are very important to generate the risk areas in which uh, lakes are at a high risk and uh, through that uh, such uh, information can be circulated at the uh, country level block level district level and the uh, local uh, district administration or the government at a centralized level can create a uh, mitigation and me uh, measurements so that we can stop or we can mitigate such kinds of disaster to be happen in near future and with this i'll be ending my today's presentation on application of uh, remote sensing in uh, glacial lake outbox flood and uh, this is the best technique i'll say if you want to study so uh, that's my suggestion to each and every young researcher who is want to study glaciers or who want to uh, have a field of expertise in the field of uh, disaster my suggestion would be ki better you go for glof as a your study area or area of research because still there is a lot of study uh, that has not been done there is a lot of scope because right now what we have seen is a, a study or a definition that i have suggested you on the basis of optical remote sensing data but still there is a lot of possibility and lot of new insights can be taken up in current future with new models created with uh, using of microwave data sets because that have got a subsurface penetration power as well as hyperspectral remote sensing satellite data sets which has got a multi spectral channel so there are the differentiation of various arch features will be more prominent and we can have a more detailed uh, more uh, insight about the disasters that are hitting Uh, or knocking our doors because of the change in the climatic condition that we human being have created because of our anthropogenic activities that we are involved in, and uh, we we are using this uh, latest techniques, the latest instrumentation, we can create a new and more effective uh, 
uh, early warning system related to glacial lake outburst flow with a higher accuracy, with a higher measurement, with a higher calculation. And with this, I'll be ending my today's presentation. Hope that uh, I have justified your many of the topics and many of the things related to your glacial lake outburst flood. And uh, now uh, you must have or must be familiar with a few of the terms that are associated with glacial lake outburst flood, like uh, uh, zone of accumulation, zone of ablation, snot area, moraines. Uh, snow, glaciers, rock types, uh, bathymetry analysis, different indices. So we'll be taking all these parameters into consideration for creation of our new model. And uh, with this, I'll be ending. Thereafter, we'll be having a few minutes of uh, class discussion. Thereafter, we'll have uh, your LMS increase. And thereafter, I'll be closing today's class. Have a good day. Bye-bye.